Hey guys, it's Casey and welcome back for another Unreal tutorial. Today I'm going to talk about why kind of I guess it's how and why we use child and parent classes. And to explain this, I want to make let's just make kind of like an enemy for a game. Maybe this is like an RPG game and we have an enemy. So what I'm just going to do is I'm just going to right click and make a new blueprint. I'm going to make a new character and I'm just going to call this my base enemy. And the idea here is that this base class, this top level parent class, we will never be directly spawning this class in the world. What will happen is that we will make children of this class that are then acting as all of the enemies in our game. And kind of the reason why we do this is so that we can reuse as much code as possible and really speed up our process. So I'm just gonna set a mesh real quick just for visual reasons. So this can be our enemy. We'll make that 90. So in, in theory, this is our base enemy class. It doesn't really mean much, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna add some variables to it. So what what we want wanna think about is what is equal among all of our among all of our children, among all of our enemies. What do they all have in common? Well, they're all gonna have health, so we can make a health. Um, let's see what else. They're all probably gonna have damage. Maybe let's say like attack speed. So like, right, like we can have all of these variables that they're probably all gonna share in common, but we don't like, we, we wanna make it in the top level class so that they all share it. And I'll kind of show you how this works. So now with the space enemy, what we can do is we can right click and at the top we can do create child. So now we suddenly have a child and I can call this like our small enemy. And if we open up our small enemy, you can see it kind of looks like it took nothing from the parent, but in reality it did. And if we hit this little eyeball on the left side here, you can see we have this show inherited variables. If we put, press that and inside of our variables, we now have these variables here. So if I uncheck that, you can see it all disappears and it looks like we have no variables. But if we show the inherited variables, you can see down here, now we have our health damage and attack speed. And we can customize these values. The parent's values here will not override the child's. So inside of this small enemy, we can make him have like 25 health. We can make him have like 10 damage. And that's all good and dandy. And if we make another child here inside the base enemy, we'll call this our big enemy. And we can go inside of him and we can make his health be even higher. We can give him 100 health and say like 30 damage or something of that sort. And I believe we can even scale these guys. So if we want to take the capsule component inside the big enemy, make him like 1.5 and take our small enemy and we can make him like 0.75 and that if we place them both in the world we should see that we have a big guy and we have a small guy it's clipping in but and these derive from the same exact parent so that damage variable is shared between them right while they can have different values in theory they're sharing the same the same type of variable from the parent so why would we do this well you can see as, as you get more complex in your game and as you start to add a bunch of functions and which we'll do one in a second and we start having a bunch of variables and we have a bunch of actions they want to do, it would be pretty bad as if we wanted to add another enemy in our game that we're maybe rewriting all of that code. That kind of sucks. I have shown a different way of doing, other than doing parent-child classes, I have shown an alternative method, especially in like the tower defense project, where I showed how we can use structs and data tables to drive our to drive our information rather than doing childs and i think the parent child method is very good when you have a very very limited amount of children going on say we we're doing enemies for a game and we only plan on having seven enemies in our game then i think the parent child method is the way to go I, I just think it is but if you start making a game where you're maybe having a hundred enemies or say you're doing the same method with spells and you plan on having a ton of spells in your game it the the data table method is a lot better and maybe at the end of this i'll kind of show how we can mix the data table method the the data driven method versus the child method but i'll continue with this for now just as like a side note so how, how do we do functions then? So variables are very obvious. We have variables, we can share them, that's, that's good to go. Well, the other thing we can do is say, what do our enemies need to do? Our enemies need to do damage. So let's make a function for damage player. So inside of this function, we will damage the player. And how will we damage the player? Well, we can grab that damage variable and we can just say, hmm, let's see here. Hmm, how do we wanna output this? 
let's just say let's just do the output of this and we'll pretend that the output of this function is d directly damaging the player and we'll make that float and we'll say output damage so what we could just do is we could just do damage player we would do our casting to find the player or having our target and doing something inside the player that's what we're pretending this return node is but in, in essence if we wanted something this simple we could do that and now inside of our enemies inside of our small enemy while we don't directly see the function here we can call damage player and we can do that in both of our children here so while this is a very simplistic method in kind of like a kind of crappy example this can get a lot more complex let's say we wanted our smaller enemy to do kind of like a modifier to this damage let's say we wanted our small enemy to do damage based on how far away he is from the player and maybe we wanted our big enemy to have a damage multiplier based on how close he is to the player how would we achieve that it gets kind of awkward and if you kind of think of it in a very basic way, you'd think we need different functions for our damage. Just because they're calculating two different types of damage, we can't use the same damage. And that's kind of true and false. What we can do is we can make an extra function and we could call this, um, we can call this like our damage modifier. And inside of our damage modifier, what we want to output is we want to output our modified damage. And now what we can do is inside of our damage player, what we can do is we can call this damage modifier. And what this is going to output is modified damage. And what we can do is we can just add this to our normal damage and have an output. So what's happening here in the parent is that we're grabbing the damage that we're setting inside the child and we're adding it to this function of damage modifier. But inside the parent, we're going to leave this absolutely empty. All we did is we set up the output node and we made this empty. So as far as it looks like in the parent, it looks like this, this function will never do anything but we can override this inside of our children. So inside of our small enemy, if we go over to our functions over here on the left side, we can do override. And if we look for damage modifier, we can override damage modifier. And what this override means is that when this gets called here on this damage modifier, inside of this child, it's going gonna, it's gonna to run into this function. It's going to run whatever is inside of this function. And we just also so happen to have our parent call of damage modifier. So say we had something inside of here, inside of our parent. What we could have happen if we wanted to is we could have some code run to the, like, to the left of it here inside of our child, do some modifications. Then we could have our parent version of it run, do some modifications, and then we could do an output. But because our, because our parent one is completely empty here, we can just delete out this parent call. And now we have a completely overridden damage modifier. So inside of our small enemy, we could do whatever amount of math based on like on how far away. And we could do a bunch of math here. We could add a bunch of stuff together. We could do some lerps. We could do some crazy stuff. But what's going to happen is that this can be completely different than what we do in our big enemy. So inside of our big enemy, we can also override and we can go down to our damage modifier and we can do the same thing, but we can have it be a completely different subset of rules here. We can modify this damage in completely different ways. But inside the parent class, what happens is that when we go to damage a player, it's going to call this and then all the children will have their own ways of modifying this damage. And that's how we can kind of get customization through child parent, um, we can reuse the same parent functions and variables and stuff, but we can get the customization inside of our children by overriding. And we can do overrides with custom events too. Um, the, the, the same thing if we add a custom event and we could just say attack custom. If we go over to our children, if we right click and open space, if we typed in, what did I call it? Custom, attack custom. We can override it here. Actually, no, that's calling it. Sorry. If we type attack custom, there we go. That's the override. So now this custom event here is overriding the one inside of our parent here. And that's kind of the same thing as overriding the function. We could do it here, I believe. If we did override, does it pop up here? Let's see if we delete that. If we do, I don't think it pops up here. I don't believe. No, it does not. Yeah. So you have to search for it and do attack custom. And that's how you override that. So that's kind of how we can override variables. But what we would really aim for here is that we would be doing a bunch of code inside of the base class of our, of our, of our enemy. This may be if we, for example, say in theory, we did it, our AI inside of, inside of the actor itself. You wouldn't normally do that, but let's just say on tick, we're moving towards the player here. We could stuff 
do things with like move to a location. We could be doing distance checks. We could be getting distance between our target and ourself. And if we are, then we could be calling calling like our damage player function and stuff like that. And that's kind of the point of this is that we would set up like all of the code that gets shared with our enemies would happen here. And like I showed, if we wanted to have some type of custom stuff here, we could do so. Instead of saying that calling this like attack custom, we could call this move custom. And inside the parent, this could directly do nothing. But we could call this here, and that inside of our child, if we wanted to, we could add some custom movement actions to be happening here. And the idea is that if we set up our base with all of our shared actions and all of that stuff, what happens is that after we do that one setup, now I can go in, I can make a new child of my base, and I can call this my archer enemy. Oops, that's not spelling, archer enemy. And now inside of this archer enemy, I can override whatever I need to. Let's say I wanted him to behave like every other enemy. I just want him to have maybe a different mesh. I could change the mesh. I could change his size. I can change his health damage attack speed variables. And if I want to add any extra functionality, as I showed, we can override our custom, our custom events. We could override our damage modifiers. And now with just two simple clicks and maybe a change of a few variables, we now have a fully functioning enemy that maybe behaves completely differently or has damage or whatever happens to be completely different than other enemies. And that's why we would use parent childs. And that's kind of why we'd use them or how we would use them. So as I said before, I'm not always a fan of always using um, child parent um, relationships. Sometimes what I like to do is I like to just have a base class of an enemy. And then inside of this, what I would do is I would store, say, a variable, and this variable would be its name. And that what we would do is on begin play, what we can do is we can make a struct, and this can be our enemy struct. We will just add like a few things here. Let's just replicate the other variables. We would do damage, we could have health. And I believe the other one we made was attack speed. Let's just make that. And that what we will do is we will make a data table for this. If we go under miscellaneous, we can do data table, grab our new struct, which is our enemy struct. And we can call this our enemy table. And inside of our enemy table, we can um, we could add a new row. And then just as we did before, we could make our big enemy inside of here. And that we could then give him numbers here. We'll just throw in some random stuff there and that on begin play of our enemy what we could do is we could just grab our name and we could get our data table row and now what happens is that if we set that to be that table we now on begin play have access to the variables of our child so why would we do this over the parent child method well the reason why i love this is because the data tables are literally spreadsheets are, is what is happening here and that this makes it so nice to work with and that say we had a hundred enemies in our game how would we balance our 100 enemies if we had parent-child relationships? What we would have to do to balance our game is we would have to go into our big enemy, we'd have to go in, change his damage, save and compile, then we would have to go to our archer enemy, go to his health damage, change some variables, and it becomes a really long, tedious process, and to find their, to find their information, you're having to dig into each one and actually highlight the variables to see their values. If we use a data table to drive it, we can have all of our enemies here with all of their information. And the best part is this can export and import from Excel. So you can move all of your data to Excel. You can do whatever complicated algorithms you have in Excel to maybe see how good or bad your enemies are. You can do your modifications all in Excel with your formulas and whatnot, and then import it back in. And now all of your enemies are updated and working because just the data table is being pulled on begin play of the enemy. So. That's just kind of the pros and cons of both. I would definitely use parent childs for kind of limited uses where maybe you only have five uses of it, maybe 10. But once you start getting to these bigger numbers, especially for something that you might need to be balancing later, I think that's like a big key point here is that if you ever need to manipulate the data in the future, especially on a large scale across all of your children, it becomes really, really messed up. It, do, it doesn't become pretty, and that's where I'm a big advocate of data tables. But as I said, we can mix the two. So what we could do is on begin play, we could store our name and we could pull it. So now inside of our child, say small enemy, we could make his name small enemy. And now what happens is that on begin play, actually let's promote this to a variable. We'll promote that and we'll call it this our table. And now what happens is that on begin play, 
since this is the parent, this begin play will get run inside the child. And now the child, because we set his name variable here to be small enemy on begin play, it will grab small enemy from the table and it will store it. And now inside of my child, I have access to these variables. And this is the same among all of our among all of our uh, enemies. So now in my big enemy, I can set his name to be big enemy. And now on begin play, it's gonna grab his information from the table. So that's kind of the cool part is that we can mix the two. So we could use data tables to kind of do our stats and stuff like that and hold kind of our values, our floats and what and whatnot. But inside, we will use the parent-child method to actually hold all of these functions. So we're kind of mixing the two. We're still getting the override so that we can override like our damage modifier inside of our children. But we're also not just using their base variables to set their information. Because once again, if you start having a bunch of them, it becomes really messy and really hard to go in by hand and change all of their values one by one. And then you don't really know what their values are unless you go in one by one or you have them stored somewhere else in the text document or something. But that's just kind of what I'm an advocate for. I'm an advocate for mixing the two. I'm doing that in a current project right now. It's something that I love doing. It's something I never really dove in too much. I've used ch child parents a little bit, but as I've started to do some really complex things, you really start to realize how powerful some of the options you have are and how you don't need to duplicate code everywhere to get like small changes and stuff. So I think that's it for this video, guys. I'll be doing a few more um, kind of related to this. Maybe we'll see, but I'll see you guys in the next video.